we'd like to welcome you to this very exciting event to announce the latest development of the Raspberry Pi product roadmap. I'm Claire Doyle, head of Raspberry Pi for Element 14. The Raspberry Pi has been revolutionary board for engineers and electronic enthusiasts. And Element 14 has been instrumental in its evolution. Shortly, I'm going to be handing over to Eben Upton, CEO of Pi Trading, to talk to you about this very latest exciting technology release. I'll then give you an overview of how Element 14 has put this device in the hands of customers through the manufacturing and global distribution of Raspberry Pi, supported by an impressive ecosystem of exclusively designed Element 14 accessories. We'll then have a Q&A, which Eben and myself will chair, along with Richard Curtin, Vice President of Strategic Alliance from Element 14. And we'll also be supported through that Q&A by Liz Upton, Head of Communications and Marketing for Pi Trading, and also Pete Lomas, and one of the co-founders of Pi, and also one of the board directors of Pi Foundation. For those of you and all our friends out there on the Hangout, um, please email your questions through. We'd love to hear from you. The email address is media at element14.com. And don't forget, the Hangout is recorded and will be available um, for you to watch again, if you like it that much, um, on Element 14 community website later on today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Evan Upton, CEO of Pi Trading. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. So, <clears throat> welcome, welcome, guys. Uh, thanks for turning out so early on a Monday morning. Um, I just thought, yeah, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this new toy that we're announcing today. So, we've been doing Raspberry Pi for, um, depending on how you count, somewhere between three and eight years. Um, and as I guess a lot of you know, you know, the thing that we've been trying to do with Raspberry Pi is to get more children uh, into computing. We've been trying to give children today the same kind of experience that uh, people of my generation, people who grew up in the 1980s and early 1990s had, the idea of having a computer in your bedroom which is hackable, which is fun, that you can do fun stuff with, but which is also hackable and gives you a fighting chance of you know, actually learning something about what goes, in, goes on inside the shiny box. Um, we put the original Raspberry Pi into the market with Element 14 on the 29th of, uh, 29th of February 2012. Uh, it's an appalling decision because you know, our birthday parties haven't been really particularly good so far. We're going to have an absolutely fantastic birth birthday party next year. Um, but so we are almost exactly 35, almost exactly 35 months into Raspberry Pi. Um, it's been successful, I guess, beyond our wildest dreams. When we were first doing Raspberry Pi, I think we, we thought, what did we think? We thought we were going to do 2,000, 10,000 <coughs> 10, in our wildest dreams. We might get 10,000 of these into the hands of kids. Uh, we're three years in. We've sold about 4.5 million of them. We think somewhere between one and two million of those are now in the hands of children. I think for the first few months, <clears throat> maybe we were concerned they were going into the pockets of people like me. Um, but over time, it's become clear that there is interest among children uh, in learning computing. As much as anything, there's interest from children uh, in learning a thing that their parents don't understand. Um, and we've been doing this at the same time as a lot of other people. You know, obviously, we've come, we've come to this realization that there's a need for more computer literacy, more genuine, meaningful computer literacy among young people, at the same time as a lot of other voluntary organizations, such as Code.org, um, uh, Code Club, and uh, Code Dojo, and also a growing interest from a lot of corporates. We've had some fantastic support from, uh, we've had some fantastic support from Google, we've had some fantastic support from Oracle in getting Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi related products out into the education system in the UK. Um, so yeah, four and a half million Raspberry Pis, one and a half million of them in the hands of kids. I guess a real surprise for us has been A, the level of hobbyist interest in this, and B, the level of industrial interest in this. So we've actually seen people starting to use Raspberry Pis as industrial control computers. And we've started to see probably over the last year as we've made uh, sort of strides with the software stack on the Raspberry Pi, we've seen people starting to actually use the Raspberry Pi as a regular computer. So you see people finding ways to use a Raspberry Pi as a productivity machine. Um, so. Um, all the way through that, we've, we've done a lot of software investment to make Raspberry Pi 1 into a genuine usable 
um, productivity machine. But all through this, there has been, all through the last three years, there has been this awareness um, that Raspberry Pi as a platform is deficient in some respects. So Raspberry Pi has a level of computing power of you know a PC from the turn of the century. Um, even after we doubled the RAM six months into the uh, program, still only had half a gigabyte of memory. Um, and so for the last year, we've been looking at ways that we can um, produce a follow-on, a success as a Raspberry Pi that retains all of, the, you know, all of the positive things about Raspberry Pi, and in particular retains compatibility, and that's really been key to us, retains complete compatibility with the existing Raspberry Pi product line, uh, but addresses those two, those two deficiencies. Um, and today we've got one. So this is a Raspberry Pi 2. Those of you who've seen a Raspberry Pi B+, which is the product we've been shipping since last July, will find it looks kind of um, dispiritingly identical. Um, if you look on the back, you can see the memory's on the back now. That's, that's the, major, that's the major, major aesthetic change. That's what, we're, that's what we're selling this morning, is a computer with memory on the back. Um, but what we've done is we've gone from a single core 700 megahertz ARM 11 to a quad core 900 megahertz ARM Cortex A A7. Uh, it gives us something like six times the processing power. It takes Raspberry Pi to a, a level of performance which makes it genuinely a PC. Um, we have people in the office, we have power users in the office of Raspberry Pi now who are using this as their PC at home. Uh, it is a usable little Linux box. Uh, we've been able to double the memory um, uh, to, 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 one, to one gigabyte, thanks to some sterling work from our friends at Micron. Um, Really what we think Raspberry Pi does is it removes that caveat. Raspberry Pi was a great little PC insofar as it cost you $35. You had to be a bit forgiving because it cost you $35. This still costs $35. This is just a, a great PC. There is no caveat. Um, so we've had a fantastic time developing this. There's been a couple of years of, uh, of some of the most fun engineering I've ever done, certainly. Um, there are about, what, how many of them are these are there in existence today? 100,000-ish? Um, we've been building these solidly at... Uh, um, uh, Sony in South Wales um, for the last uh, few weeks. There are about 100,000 that are in existence. They're available for sale today from our partners at Element 14. Um, and we really can't wait to see what people get up to with them. Uh, so, yeah, hoping for another three good years of, uh, with this one in the market. So, thanks very much. Yeah, Brock Bollard, the Prop. Thank you, Evan. Well, only four weeks into the new year and um, some really, really, really exciting, exciting news. So thank you. So it's great to be launching the Raspberry Pi 2 today alongside Pi Trading. As you probably can see or you will see online, this is a truly amazing board. I would now want to talk to you about, um, to take this opportunity to talk to you about Element 14 and facilitating the incredible growth of Pi. So as Eben said, Three years ago, Element 14 played an integral role in launching the very, very first Raspberry Pi. The roadmaps evolved, and as the product portfolio has, has expanded, Element 14 is now the leading Raspberry Pi manufacturer and distributor worldwide. Since launch, Element 14 has shipped 2.8 million Raspberry Pi boards to customers across the globe. And we've also manufactured circa around 3 million Raspberry Pi boards. Today, the Raspberry Pi is sold into 110 different countries. And through Element 14 and its sister companies, Newark Element 14 and MCM in North America, Farnell Element 14 and CPC in Europe, and Element 14 in Asia Pac, supported by our brilliant, loyal, and very important part reseller partners, some of which are in the room with us today. As Evan has just said, the new Raspberry Pi 2 is six times faster, which opens up more opportunities for all customer segments, and we're expecting huge global interest in this product. <coughs> because of this, We've also developed a strong proposition working with leading world-class suppliers and manufacturers and to ensure quality and consistency of supply is absolute paramount to Element 14. Our position is to manufacture and really focus on quality products supported by an innovative ecosystem of Element 14 exclusive accessories, supported and delivered same day, next day, into the hands of our customers worldwide. 
This is achieved through Element 14's network of warehousing and multi-channel sales support. Most recently, due to its low-cost, high-performance and stable support package, we're also seeing professionals engineering design it in into industrial applications. Raspberry Pi today is using over 75 different customer segments worldwide. As Eben said, education also remains a key priority both to the Raspberry Pi Foundation and also Element 14. In a recent survey that we, we did um, in the UK, 90% of teaching professionals in the UK now consider the skills it teaches on new computing, which is part of the UK curriculum, as absolutely paramount to school children's education. In order to support these educators, Element 14 has built the STEM area on the Element 14 community, which provides essential resources resources to teachers, resources to, to kids, and also providing educational kits which are available through our CPC and MCM business units. The Element 14 community, with over 280,000 registered members, has evolved to become an invaluable re um, resource of information, data, sharing of information, and, and projects for Raspberry Pi users. We now have nearly over 200 Pi projects, which we are giving everyone from beginners to experts the actual essential ingredients to understand and successfully build applications using the Raspberry Pi and the associated accessories. Those accessories are fundamental to our business model. Element 14 has introduced the largest number of exclusive accessories to build an extensive ecosystem around the Raspberry Pi board. I'm now going to hand over to Richard Curtin to talk a little bit more about our accessory portfolio. Richard. Thank you, Claire. <coughs> Thank you very much, Claire. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Curtin. As Claire said, I am the VP of our Strategic Alliance Division at Element 14. I want to talk to you about our exclusive accessories today and how these are supporting the exciting launch of Raspberry Pi 2. We've created a unique proposition um, at Element 14 by designing and manufacturing a range of exclusive accessories for engineers and hobbyists to use the full capability of the Raspberry Pi, all of which are compatible with the new Pi Pi 2. By listening to our customers and using our in-house design capabilities, we have developed solutions for the Internet of Things, motor control, scope applications, audio and FPGA to name but a few, and they're all made available to Raspberry Pi users through products that are unique to Element 14. Let me give you some examples of the accessories that can be used with Raspberry Pi 2 as well as being compatible with the previous models like I've said. So we've supported the development of the N-Ocean sensor kit and this helps facilitate home automation for smart homes in the IoT revolution. We also work very closely with our partners at PyFace. So the PyFace Digital and the PyFace Control and Display were built to add motor control to the Raspberry Pi. We've also been working with a company called Bitscope Micro, who've created an entry-level oscilloscope for testing on the Raspberry Pi, which is very exciting. And the Cirrus Logic audio card was designed to make high-definition audio accessible uh, through Raspberry Pi. So through our leading-edge technology and design capabilities, we will continue to work closely with our customers to develop the, to develop the roadmap of exciting new products for this year, 2015, and beyond, facilitating ever-exciting applications with the Raspberry Pi. Full product details of these accessories can be seen on the Element 14 community website, and you can see them working live with the Raspberry Pi here uh, after the presentations in the demo room. So, with the launch of the Raspberry Pi 2, we really believe that people's imagination truly is the only limiting factor working with these products. And I'd now hand back to Claire to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Wow. 
very exciting morning already and we're just 15, 20 minutes in. So um, if we look at 2015, already we have so much exciting news from Pi Trading. Thank you, Eben. Thank you, the Pi Trading team. We're now going to move to some questions, which is a live Q&A. For the people in the room, um, we have a roaming mic. Um, Jen Patterson will, um, Jen, if you want to stand up, um, will take questions from in the room. As I've said before, we welcome everybody out there on the Hangout, um, whether it's morning, evening, whatever time, wherever you are in the world, please, please send us through some questions. Um, we will be answering equally the ones in the room and online, and that's at media at element14.com. So I'm now going to hand over to Jen Patterson. We also have Liz Upton here, who's Head of Marketing and Communications for Pi Trading, and will facilitate a Q&A. I'm going to sit back down, OK? <laughs> Hi, it looks fantastic. Um, one of the uh, things that has come up with the existing Raspberry Pi is that if you attach USB devices, the power available is very limited, which mm -hmm. means that uh, you have to supply additional power to the, yeah. quite often to the USB devices that you attach. Mm -hmm. I noticed that your release refers to powered hard drives, but can you say a bit about how you address this issue? And, and have you considered? Uh, a way of um, providing supplementary power to the Raspberry Pi itself to enable yeah. more powered USB devices to be attached? So, because Raspberry Pi is powered from a USB, uh, micro USB um, phone charger effectively, um, it's an interesting, there's a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a balance to be struck here, right? In that you don't want your downstream USB devices to be able to brown out the, uh, brown out the five volt rail, pull the five volt rail down, and then knock over the, the CPU. So what we've ended up doing the, um, the Raspberry Pi 2, as with the Model B Plus, has a configurable current limit, uh, which you can set to either I think 600 milliamps or 1.2 amps. Um, beyond that, you do need a powered hub. So if you're, if you're prepared to set the 1.2 amp limit, then you, you can have 1.2 amps, but not beyond that. Could I just ask, if you're asking questions in the room, could you just yeah. introduce yourself and say yeah. um, where you're from as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is John Barrett. Uh, question. Uh, for DevKit magazine. Um, looking at the sort of Maker Pro um, style market um, and regarding the accessories, normally if I was, if I've got a microprocessor dev kit um, and I was using that as a development platform, get to the end of that process, I'd discard that kit, take the bill of materials, engineer um, a, a sort of finished product. It's the idea here that um, if I was using Pi for doing that, I would retain that kind of um, board framework and then build an accessory package around it for, for the end product uh, rather than taking the bill of materials and trying to re-engineer it into a final product. Can I ask Richard to comment on that and then Eben? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think um, what we're trying to do with the um, access accessory strategies is open up new technology to be used around the board like you just said. However, I think there is two ways that customer can go, that user, that maker. Absolutely, they can retain the Raspberry Pi as the heart of that design and change the peripheral set as required depending on which area they're, they're looking at. Um, or, of course, they can build something totally new. And actually, Raspberry Pi trading are looking at ways, and actually we've launched a product already out on the market, uh, the Compute Pi, which allows customers to uh, run customization so they can change the peripheral sets around the same chip and memory packages um, uh, that they love and know on the Raspberry Pi uh, to, to enhance that. Uh, but I don't know if you want to, to yeah. answer that, perhaps. Yeah, so I mean, the, compute, the compute module is the kind of core of the Raspberry Pi offering for people who want to do to follow the Maker Pro route. I mean, we've been surprised by how many people have followed the Maker Pro route just using Raspberry Pi itself and how many, how many Raspberry Pis we sell into, um, into, integrator, into integrator businesses. But certainly we've seen, we've seen a lot of, com of interesting compute module and Raspberry Pi 1 compute module. Mm -hmm. There will at some point be a Raspberry Pi 2 Compute module. That's not that's not an immediately planned thing. I think we're just quite focused on getting Raspberry Pi two itself out of the door. Um, but um, yeah, no, that's we've been quite we've been quite pleased with the take up. We've been quite pleased with the take up that we've moved some thousands of, of dev kits for the compute module. Starting to see volume orders for compute module coming through now. So I think it is starting to stick as a concept. Okay, thanks. Hi. Uh, 
Hi, uh, Kane Fulton, techradar.com. Um, the six times more powerful figure, um, was that, is, did you arrive to that number based on specs or any particular benchmarks? Uh, so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's Sysbench, that's uh, Sysbench multi-core um, CPU benchmark. Um, it's, that number's a, it's interesting, right? Um, you gotta come with a number that's in the middle. I mean, I think we've seen, we've seen a single core, um, if you have a single core micro benchmark, we've seen speed ups of under 2x. Um, that's largely because micro benchmarks don't punish the ARM 11 as hard as they probably ought to. Um, a more realistic single core, pure single core use case from like Sun Spider is in the sort of 4x range. Uh, we've seen some, I've seen multi core neon enabled codec benchmarks, which are something like 28x faster. So 6x felt like the number we could sort of, we could stand behind because there's a particular benchmark that generates it. We've got, there was somebody at the back. Yeah, we've, we've also got, um, we've got lots of questions in the room, and thank you, everybody. Um, we are in a beautiful room in the Shard Hotel in London. Um, but I'd also just want to ensure that we um, incorporate our, um, everyone on the Hangout as well. So I'm just going to move to... Can we, can we just take that one at the back? Because okay. there's been... Um, hi, uh, Ross long. Snowden from the Yorkshire Post. Um, I wondered what your sales predictions are. If you sold 3.5 million of the original one, and mm -hmm. who's going to be buying it? Is it people who've already got Raspberry Pis? Uh, so I think it's <clears throat> so I think it's going to be a mix. Um, I, our sales projections, we'd like to sell maybe a total of three million in 2015. Would be a would, would be a you know a, a good that would be a good 2015 if we do that. Um, in terms of who we're going to be selling them to, I think <clears throat> a, um, obviously a lot. I think a lot of existing Raspberry Pi users are going to take the opportunity to upgrade. And the interesting thing about Pi 2 though is that it does broaden. It does broaden out into um, uh, it does broaden out the sort of addressable market a little bit. So you know we we're hoping with this product we stand a chance of actually starting to have people buy them as set maybe the second PC in their house, a replacement PC. Um, it's got to that kind of level now where we can go to different market segments. So do you think it could possibly be three million a year? That's and that's what we, that's where we'd like to be. We've done about we we did about between two and two and a half million in 2014. It would be nice to be at three million this year. Hi, I've got a question that's come through on email. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a lot of chatter on um, Twitter at the moment about Windows 10 support <laughs> and Microsoft <laughs> coming from you the wait for this question. Yeah. Um, yeah, could you cool. elaborate I, on uh, Windows I, 10 I, support for the Raspberry Pi 2? Yes, so, so this is this is this is the this is re a really really exciting um, thing for us. So <clears throat> Raspberry Pi uh, Raspberry Pi One um, used an ARM 11 processor, which is a um, which implements the ARMv6 instruction set architecture. Um, in moving to this new core, we're now uh, using the ARMv7 instruction set architecture, which, which broadens out the range of operating systems that you can run on Raspberry Pi. Historically, we've run an operating system we call Raspbian, which is a custom ARMv6 rebuild of sort of the mainstream uh, ARMv7 Debian. With ARMv7, two new operating systems that people have wanted on the Pi for a long time come into, come into view. One of them is Ubuntu. Uh, a lot of people have uh, wanted Ubuntu since, since, since the first end. There is, I believe, an Ubuntu Snappy core um, image available for download today. The other one, which I think is probably going to raise quite a few eyebrows, is Windows 10. Um, so we've been working with Microsoft for the last, um, we've been working with Microsoft for about the last six months uh, to enable Windows 10 on Raspberry Pi. Um, it runs. I've seen it running. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, now this is a version. This is this is Windows 10 primarily targeted for IoT applications. So the intention here is to have a device which you can use uh, to build um, IoT devices which have screens attached, um, and it participates in the sort of broad range of Windows 10 API support. So the intention is you can take a Windows 10 application that you can run on a Surface, that you can run on a PC, that you can run on a um, uh, and, uh, that you can run on a, a um, Windows mobile phone, and now you'll be able to run it on a Raspberry Pi as well. So that's, uh, and that's something which there'll be more information from Microsoft. That isn't being launched today, but there'll be more information. Microsoft have a blog post, I think, live now, um, and there will be more information about that from Microsoft through 2015. So yeah, that Yep, that's great. It. Thank yeah. you very much. I've also got a question as well, just here from uh, Bangalore. They're watching live in um, our Element 14 offices. Um, just asking <coughs> the difference between the B plus and the two, if any, from a power consumption standpoint. Um, so, um, some of you may recall from the from the B to the B plus, we saved about a watt through improved improved power supply design. Um, the 
Raspberry Pi 2 when idle consumes about the same power as a Raspberry Pi B plus when idle. However, because you have a lot more CPU performance available, you can, when, you, when you put it under very heavy load, it will consume more. And what we've effectively done is we've brought Raspberry Pi 2 back to the level of the Raspberry Pi B in terms of peak power consumption. So we've spent all of that power saving that we went from B to B plus. We've spent all of that power saving on increased, C, uh, increased CPU performance. If we move back to the room, is there any got a question in the room? <coughs> Hi, Steve Bush from Electronics Weekly. In the move from V6 to V7 architecture, is that going to leave some of the educational users behind if they've only got a B or a B plus? Um, yeah, good question. So um, today, what we're what we're shipping as an operating system from our website is a, a single SD card image which has a V6 Linux kernel and a set of V6 kernel modules and a V7 kernel and a set of V7 kernel modules. Um, the user land is a V6 user land, so the user land is the uh, Raspbian user land. Uh, and that means that at the moment we can, we can move forward and everyone who has, we don't want to orphan four and a half million Raspberry Pi users, right? So we can move forward and keep those guys supported while still supporting Raspberry Pi 2. Now the big question is, are there performance benefits available from going to regular, from, from moving our user land to ARM v7? I'm a kind of skeptical that there are massive general performance improvements available. There obviously be some specific performance improvements available from taking your codec libraries and blitter libraries and stuff and porting those across. So what I suspect, we're going to do some benchmarking over the next few months. In the extreme case, we may end up having separate ARM v6 and ARM v7 SD card images. I suspect it's more likely that what we'll end up doing is having um, it selectively, is having stuff which selectively at boot time swaps out maybe 10 or 20 packages between the two uh, dependent on the architecture. We'd very much like to stick with a single SD card image because it's more convenient for us. I think just to add to that as well is um, as we've launched the Pi 2 today, um, the B plus still remains part of our product portfolio. Yes. We're still seeing customer demand worldwide. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a whole portfolio of Raspberry Pi products now, whether that is Compute, um, the B+, Plus, now we're launching the Pi 2. But they remain part of the product portfolio and available um, from Element 14. Yeah. We don't, I mean, that's been a big change for us as we've picked on more industrial customers. The importance of not orphaning people has become much more sort of pressing in our, pressing in our minds. Obviously, we have the, the Compute module and the A+, Plus are still based on the ARM v6 architecture. Um, the A plus will remain our kind of our, the anchor point for twenty dollars remains the anchor point for the sort of low end of the Raspberry Pi range. I've got I've just got a quick question here for probably Richard. Mm -hmm. um, which are your most popular accessories? And um, also, uh, I think Claire, you mentioned about um, Pi being used in industrial settings. If you can give some examples of that. Yep, sure, shall I start? Yep. So I think, um, so we have a whole host, a whole range of accessories available now for the Raspberry Pi product portfolio, but there's absolutely some clear winners in there with regards to what's been picked up and has got the best attach rates. Now I don't have the attach rates as percentages with me now, but what I can tell you from a product perspective is that we've definitely seen huge pickup and attachment with the uh, Raspberry Pi cameras. So there's the, the camera and there's the night camera or the, the Pi Noir. Um, this is a hugely successful product as well as um, the, the connectivity part of Pi, so the wireless adapter that we have, the USB, we call it the Y-Pi. Again, uh, this has been an area where we know Pi users are uh, very interested. And then I think the third one, what I will mention uh, uh, for, for this question is, um, we work very closely with the PiFace team. Uh, this continues to be a very strategic element of our ecosystem around Raspberry Pi, and we are continuing to expand that roadmap. Um, so they would be the, the top ones, but I think as, as Pi 2 unfolds after today, um, our product roadmap will start to be released to market, and uh, I really do think we're going to see even more traction in some key areas, particularly around IoT. Um, and uh, yeah, keep looking at Element 14 community for, for more information. Claire, I'll hand over to you for the, the other part of that question, I think. There's a, a question <coughs> around which um, segments is Pi being designed into? Um, and used. I think as I referred to in the presentation, Pi currently, from our latest customer survey, is used in over 75 different segments. The great thing about Pi is it's not just as everyone can use it and it can be used for everything. If we look at some of the kind of designing, um, um, how it's been used for designing, 
Um, a lot of that specifics and detail are under NDA with customers, but in general, um, we've seen it used for security systems, we've seen it in heating systems, we've seen it in industrial. Um, there's a whole variety of really, really exciting um, designing work that is happening globally um, for the Raspberry Pi. So, um, I so guess some nice we've seen some nice telecoms applications. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a big... The, you see them just controlling, just being kind of supervisory intelligence, I think, for, for quite a broad range of stuff. So you've, mm -hmm. got the, you've got a world in which is supervisory intelligence for some product, and then you've got this world, this, you mentioned heating. We've seen, we've seen a, a, a bizarre number of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. You know, sort of internet, adding internet of things like functionality to things which are internet of big things. Because yeah, one of the things about the Pi, unless you use the compute module, it's actually physically quite large by the standards of something you might embed in something. And so if you've got a big air conditioning system that's like that, you can find room inside it for a Pi. And so we've seen that's a, seen a lot of people who have large pieces of industrial or residential equipment using it as a way to bridge a legacy device into the kind of IoT land. Fun. Yeah, just to, just to add one more piece, just to show just how diverse uh, this part of the Raspberry Pi designing is. You know, we're also in talks now with a, 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 a user who is looking at a pinball solution for a pinball machine. So, you know, from one extreme to the other, um, but it just shows that diverse range of, you know, what people are finding great uses for uh, as a designing tool. Okay. From the engineer, um, this follows on quite nicely from that, actually. I was wanted to ask about industrial applications. Can you just talk about... Um, to what degree you kind of saw that, you see that being a, one of these um, new markets where mm. you, you'll be bringing in new users, yeah. and how has that influenced the development of the Pi, and Richard, yeah. if you could say a similar thing about uh, yeah. accessories. Okay, so, so um, I actually suspect a significant number of industrial customers will keep using the Pi 1, because you see the things that, that industrial customers are doing with it, and often they require an amount of, they want a, a, a Linux box, but they don't really mind how much CPU performance it has, and therefore, you know, what they want is something which is stable and cheap and sufficiently performant. Um, it's not necessarily clear that a lot of that base will move to Pi 2. I think there is a world of industrial customers that will benefit from Pi 2. I think a lot of those are people who are doing things with vision. Um, the ability to, the, the, um, the, the multi-core that we, the, Quad Cortex A7 that we have in Pi 2 perform, seems to perform particularly well when doing computer vision applications. And so we think there's going to be a significant <laughs> amount of stuff there. So it's kind of like, it's probably kind of pushing out the edges of the industrial market, but I think that there's, there's actually quite a large industrial segment which, which sits inside the perimeter of what you can do with a Pi 1 or a Pi 1 compute module. You? Richard, do you want to yeah, comment? Yeah, just I mean, just to add on to just to, to what Evan said, I think, and the only the only other piece I would mention there is just with regards to that industrial customer base, and you know, you talk about opening up new markets for for Raspberry Pi. Um, I think what's really interesting is that you know we we as Element 14 have always been a, a business to business uh, uh, company, um, but Raspberry Pi has changed and shifted the dynamics where we are starting to obviously build a huge uh, consumer following. I think now with the Raspberry Pi roadmap and the likes of Compute Pi, we've actually started to do the due diligence of following the customers more closely in our core space, which could be industrial or medical or, or military, whatever, whatever those applications are. And I think what we're going to see this year is a lot more um, uh, uh, information around what those customers are doing as we look to offer our <coughs> services from a design perspective. So we offer design services to customers who've bought potentially a Compute Pi that are talking to is about what exactly they're wanting to do with that and I think that you know it, as we move into Q1 and Q2 of this year will be a very interesting part of the Raspberry Pi story um, so watch this space on that. We've got another question down here. Yeah uh, you mentioned the three million for the Raspberry Pi 2 um, since you'll continue to sell the other ones as well how many pies in total do you expect will be sold this year? I think that's a really good question, and I'm sure my CFO will be watching this and trying to um, get right down the answer. Um, I think if you look at when Pi was first launched three years ago, we thought we would sell around maybe 10,000 units, and we've sold millions in that time period. So um, as we just referred to in the industrial design in space, it's new. When we look at Pi 2, um, our whole proposition and our focus is to ensure that we've got the right global supply chain in place 
with the right suppliers and the right contract manufacturers to actually flex with customer demand. And we've learned a lot about that over the last three years and um, our partnerships with key um, suppliers and manufacturers are absolutely paramount in order for us to get product in the hands of customers. How big will Pi 2 be? I think Eben's got an estimation this year alone is around 3 million. That is yeah, for Pi yeah, trading. Yeah. yeah. Told them, we keep uh, the old as well. so, 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 okay, so, so I think, yeah. I don't want to stick my neck out too far. So let's say that 3 million was a number for Pi, for Pi B plus and Pi 2. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unknown yeah. and we are really excited about this product. Um, and um, we'll map the supply chain and the stock and our, um, in, in light with customer demand. I think the um, point has been made before, but I think the point about not orphaning products is really important. You know, we sold something like 70 or 80,000 new after we introduced the, the Model B Plus mm -hmm. last July, made and sold 70 or 80,000 new Model Bs, had to restart Model B production yeah. because <laughs> of the number of people who were, um, the number of people who, Industrial designers primarily yeah. who yeah. wanted to retain that form factor, even yeah. though you know, if for a new design, and obviously there would be no reason there's no be no reason to use a model B, there was a long tail, and we expect a long tail of the B plus. We expect, in fact, because of this, the sufficiency of the CPU performance of the B plus, we actually expect that tail to be pretty long. And both will cost the same, they both cost yeah. the same. Yeah. I know we've got um, some questions coming through from the um, the hangout. Um, yeah, we've just got a question, another question from Bangalore. Um, can you actually give some specific examples of um, what the, we can do with the Pi 2 that you can't with the B plus? Evan, okay. do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, okay, so it's mostly about um, user interface response. In terms of for the majority certainly of our educational customers, and I think quite a lot of our hobbyist customers, it's about user interface responsiveness. So I think we have a couple set up next door. Um, if you sit down and use the user interface on a Raspberry Pi 2, it just feels snappier. You know, everything, <laughs> every, everything happens faster, applications load faster, um, browsing the web or editing a document is faster. All of the programming tools run much, much better. Um, so there are all of those. It's a, it's, I think it's mostly a quantitative rather than a qualitative difference. Um, there are some things like image processing that I mentioned earlier where the quantitative difference gets you into kind of a different qualitative category. Um, so where there are things that you just would not dream of doing on a Pi 1 which now become possible on a Pi 2. Yeah. Uh, Peter Gotha from Computing Magazine. Do you think that teachers who are still yet to dip their toe in and haven't actually bought one yet, may be starting to find what could be described as an increased fragmentation, as, you know, confusing or off-putting. Do you mean the, the, the different Raspberry Pi models? Yeah, because there's, what, three or four yeah. now. So, so I think that to somebody in that market segment, the only product, there's only ever one product at any given time that we promote to somebody in that market segment. And that's, that was the B plus until today, and now it's the Raspberry Pi 2. So there's always a thing we promote in that segment. For the hobbyists and industrial, we have a broader product lineup. But there's always one thing which, if you go to a teacher, the teacher would recognise as the Raspberry Pi. You know, today's Raspberry Pi. So yeah, we, it is a, it is a, it is an issue. I think what you'll see on our front page, for example, is that we have a product section on our front page, and we will today the although the B plus and the B remain saleable products for us on the Raspberry Pi front page. We will drop the B plus, and we will replace that with the, the with the uh, with the Pi two. And I think through Pi Foundation, Element fourteen community, you know, um, getting the content out there, the great work that Pi Foundation does with regards to um, teacher training, education, the Code Academy, and um, Element fourteen providing the educational kits, and to make it as easy as possible. Um, for kids wherever they are in the world to, to start using, start programming, and start learning and using Pi. Cool. Nice. Just hold so on a moment, we just way. need a vi uh, mic. <laughs> Hi, Tim Anderson, freelance journalist. Just wanted to follow up on what you said about uh, your passion for uh, computing and education and with mm. kids. W what are you doing, if anything, beyond saying, you know, here it is, do what you will? <laughs> um, so this was, uh, uh, thanks, for, no, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about that, because uh, I should have talked about that when I was up there. Um, <laughs> we, when we started, the kind of corollary of the surprising success of Raspberry Pi has been that we have money. 
um, to spend on educational activities. So, you know, originally the dream with Raspberry Pi was that the existence of the computer... What, can you, can you say, say, say it out loud? Uh, you might want to mention we're a not-for-profit. I don't think everybody's... Ah, OK, well, yeah, we're, we're a not-for-profit. So, um, the... Um, sorry. <laughs> um, the... Um, the original intention had been exactly what you described, which is that the existence of the Raspberry Pi itself was, our, was going to be our contribution. As we've become larger and we've been able to generate a surplus to fund the so Raspberry Pi trading is owned by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, we return our surplus profit up to, uh, to the foundation. Uh, the foundation has been able to do a bunch of stuff. A couple of good examples would be, uh, well, three examples. One is we make grants to organizations that are doing you know, good stuff in this area. We've supported a, This year we've supported a, a number of uh, sort of fairly prominent organizations in, in including Code Club, um, uh, with, with funding. Um, another one is we develop our own in-house educational resources, and we put the, we release those for free on our website under a Creative Commons license. And then the third thing, we have an initiative called Pi Academy, which is a teacher training program. I don't think we, I don't think we imagined we were going to be teacher training uh, providers when we got into this, did we? We didn't, but it, it's all part of the mix. Yeah. I mean, what oh, this, is Pete, Pete, this is Pete, Pete Lomas, one of my co-founders. Can we uh, get Pete a mic, uh, please? Yeah. And, and a trustee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. When we actually started, I mean, the, the whole the whole thing was education. We built the Pi because we wanted something that was accessible. And what we've got today is we've just given the kids the power to do more, and that is going to have a fantastic effect. I mean, when you've got, you know, I watch kids with Scratch on the Raspberry Pi. You introduce it to them. Ten minutes later, they've got actors whizzing around the screen. And, of course, with kids, they will push it as hard as they can. And when they get up to 25 actors, it goes quite slow. Now on the new Pi, they're not going to see that degradation, so they're going to be able to do more. And I think that was always our original intention, was education and the ability of kids to get inside the machine, look how it works, and actually then say, well, I could change this. Oh, I could expand this. I can use... My ideas, I can. Oh, no. And so that self, that self, kids, yeah. it was that whole reason. Yeah, that self-directed, that self-directed thing is still really important because I, it, I mean, ultimately, with the best will in the world, if we get, and we have, there have been amazing strides. I'm referred to it up there. We, we have, we've, there have been amazing strides elsewhere in the education of children in computing. We have a fantastic new curriculum, but with the best will in the world, you're only going to get one or two hours a week. Um, out of the school curriculum, you know, so it's, it's already packed. And therefore, it's, it's that one or two hours a week is good and is important, but it's the four or five hours a night that are the real potential to generate the next generation of a sort of, sort of very, very bright young, young computer scientists. Um, so, so that's still a very, still a core part of what we do. Uh, but it's just we've been able to just broaden it out. And the, the, so this Pi Academy, this teacher training activity we do, we've pushed, what, 150 teachers through that in the last six months? Yeah, and, and then they've really, gone back yeah. and then they've done their own sort of mini academies in their regions. Yeah. And you, you find sort of schools cascade, coalescing together to come, to come together in groups. We've also got the Raspberry Jams up and down the country. Now, they actually are very effective. We find a lot of teachers at the Manchester one. We find a lot of teachers come along just to understand what the opportunities are. But of course, the, the nice thing about Pi, for me, I'm an electronics engineer by trade, is that you can connect physical things to it. And that yeah. was really our ability to compete in the market of game, computer games. We could give them something physical. And the thing you see now, a lot of robots coming on. And if anything is going to get kids excited about something, it's being able to build a robot and actually make it do something physically in front of them from a program that they've written, either in Scratch or hopefully as they get better in Python, and then maybe controlling it from their mobile phone. or the, you know, the possibilities are endless. And our objective has always been to give the kids the power to do what they dream of. Thank you, Pete. I've got a question here from um, Jan. Um, at ETN, um, just going back to, can we talk a bit about the roadmap? Um, mm. And he also asked specifically, is there a low risk processor version planned? Uh, so, so the low risk project and Raspberry Pi are separate organisations, both out of Cambridge. Um, low risk is a is a initiative to build a fully open source um, uh, SOC. Um, so, so they're separate organisations. There's some sort of there's some crossover in membership. Of those organisations, in particular, Rob Mullins, who runs that, was a trustee of the was a founding trustee of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Uh, Alex Bradbury, who's a senior engineer on that, is also a, a key volunteer for Raspberry Pi. But they are separate organisations. There's no plan 
at the moment to offer a Raspberry Pi with a low risk SOC in it. Andrew Harrison, IDG. A quick question about manufacturing. Mm. I think we heard the South Wales factory mentioned earlier. Yeah. Is it true to say that all pies are made there? Uh, no. So um, the majority of the majority of pies are made there. Uh, we are building some for the Southeast Asian market. We're building some in Shenzhen. I think what's really important is that we map the global demand of pie, um, which is phenomenal, and we expect even future um, demand. Now we have the pie too. Mm is mapping the very latest local capabilities with global partners who have global footprints to service um, key markets yeah. to help um, those grow too. So we are totally committed to our work with Sony um, in the UK and our UK CEM um, contract manufacturer. Um, we have added um, additional global partners um, in order to facilitate um, providing products in local markets as well yeah. to support the great growth of Raspberry Pi. Mm. Can you give some kind of a percentage of, say, three million are made this year, roughly what percentage are you going to grow uh, South And we're going to be mapping that in line with um, local demand. Mm -hmm. um, so it will um, be of the order of, it's, I, I would expect it to be of the order of hundreds, hundreds of thousands in, uh, in China versus millions in Wales. Yeah. Hundred, hundreds of thousands in China versus millions in Wales. Got it. It's of that order. Yes. A very quick and basic question. Um, enclosures, is it backwards compatible with the enclosure footprint? It, 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 it is. We, we have come across at least one enclosure that touches the board somewhere where a... Um, uh, made by this man in the front row here. OK, I've actually come across two. Um, uh, uh, Paul's enclosure is laser cut, and therefore it's very easy for him to make this change. Uh, I've come across at least one injection molded case as well that happens to touch the board somewhere that a, that a component has now been placed. Because there some, some, have been some changes to the, the SOC positioning. Um, so, but by and large, yeah, anything that, anything that touches the board fairly lightly around the edges um, will, will fits perfectly. Question at the back. What was the biggest uh, design or engineering challenge in developing the, the two, and how did you overcome it? Um, hitting the price point. <laughs> um, so, so there's a lot of um, well, okay. I mean, several things. Well, one, obviously, there's an SOC engineering challenge um, that you know this is this is uh, we've had fantastic support from Broadcom, uh, our um, SOC partner, um, in producing this BCM2836 device, the successor to BCM2835. So there's a lot of exciting engineering went on at the silicon level. Um, uh, we've also, as I, as I mentioned, had some fantastic support from, uh, from Micron uh, on, the, on the memory front. Um, the, at the board level, it was mostly a, um, I guess, two things. One was a cost engineering bit. In order to make room for the extra silicon we were adding to the device, there was a lot of cost engineering went into that. Quite a lot of that cost engineering actually first appeared in the B plus. So you know, finding more effect, more cost effective ways of providing of component um, connector sets that would provide the same uh, um, performance. Uh, and then the other thing is we've moved from a pop memory technology with the memory sandwich on top of the board to a discrete memory <coughs> solution with the memory out on the PCB. So there was a lot of um, detailed work went into managing the, the DRAM bus tracking between the two SOCs, um, given the very limited board area. We benefited from the fact that at the point where we designed the B plus layout, we knew what the pinout for 2836 was going to be, and therefore B plus was kind of designed to have a large enough area in the middle of the board to accommodate the changes we needed for Pi 2. Okay, I think we've got some more questions from the Hangout. How are we doing? How are we doing in the room? Any other questions from the room? Got one down the front. Uh, Michael with IDG. I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned that the uh, price point was the most challenging one, but if there was one thing that you could add in terms of performance or component <laughs> or... <laughs> oh, well, not today, <laughs> really, really today. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, would, what would I add if I could? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm actually. I, I, I mean, we had kind of a free hand, right, with this board, right? You know, Raspberry Pi One. We were kind of constrained by the by the, the chip that we'd chosen. This one, we had an opportunity to have some input at the 
of the specification phase for the chip. So I think basically we got what we wanted. Uh, I, I can't think of anything else that I would really want the, to add. The philosophy has always been to put everything on the board that you need and try and avoid putting things that are in the periphery of, of niceties that maybe only 5% of yeah. the, the population would want. And they can get that from add-ons yeah. because the price point was always very important to us. Yeah. And as we'd always said, we wanted it to be cheap enough that kids wouldn't worry about having a go. And if they broke it, it was $35. Yeah. It wasn't $350, $700. Yeah. So yeah. Wi-Fi wi -Fi is a good example. I mean, Wi-Fi, we've always been kind of yeah. nervous about adding, <laughs> adding things to the board that are only, if we add Wi-Fi to the board and it's useful for 20 or 30% of people, then you've taxed 70 or 80% of the people in order to give a benefit to the, to the, the, the 20 or 30%. And so, you know, for things like that, we'd rather encourage the 20 or 30% to go and buy, you know, Wi-Fi. Yeah, exactly. Go and to buy, point. Yeah, it's the add-on. Yeah, you can buy, go, buy, go and buy an add-on. Yeah, so. and it's a very low-cost solution as well. A lot of those add-ons don't cost a lot, so if somebody really wants it, it's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a viable proposition. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Is there any other questions from the room? Cool. All right. OK, so a, an amazing 2015 planned with Raspberry Pi. You've heard around the Raspberry Pi 2. Um, you've heard around accessories. You've heard around Microsoft and all the exciting things that only four weeks into this new year um, Pi Trading and Element 14 is bringing to the market. So all that remains is to thank Eben and the Pi Trading team um, for joining Element 14 at this event today. Um, I just want to remind everybody that the Google um, Hangout will be available on the Element 14 community website. Um, Eben, myself, Richard, and the Pi Trading team with Liz and Pete Lomas. Um, we do have some demos in the rooms next door. You can actually get your hands on one of these boards. You can see it. You can see it working with the operating system. You can see how it compares to B+. Um, so we welcome you next door. Um, and anybody who does want further interviews, whether with Element 14 or with Eben or the Pi Trading team, we have um, Jen Patterson from the Element 14 um, PR and communications team, and we have Liz Upton here, head of communications and marketing from Pi Trading. So um, we're welcome to answer more questions. We're welcome to do more interviews. Um, but for those in the room, we um, welcome you next door to have a look at the demos, grab some coffee. And for everybody online on the Google Hangout, um, thank you very much for joining us wherever you are in the world. Um, have a brilliant, brilliant Pi Day. And I um, hope everyone gets their hands on our Raspberry Pi 2. Thank you.